Hello, and welcome back to the web. Today, what I have for you is a teardown and review of the multi-lane ML4039 100 gig Ethernet bit error rate tester, or BERT. This is a four-channel instrument that can run up to 30 gigabits per second per channel on four channels. So it's intended for things like 100 gig QSFP 28s, 40 gig QSFPs, 10 gig SFPs, 25 gig SFP 28s, etc. I picked up this instrument on eBay recently to do some testing on this Ethernet switch I've been working on, and I thought it would be interesting to share what I've learned with you. Looking at the front panel of the instrument, there are four differential pairs for transmit lanes 1, 2, 3, 4. These are 2.92 millimeter RK connectors since they go out to 30 gigabits per second per lane. Then moving right, we have receive channels 1, 2, 3, 4. Again, differential pairs, and below them, we have lock LEDs indicating the receiver sync status for each lane. And then down the center column are two single-ended connections. These are not a differential pair. We have single-ended reference clock in and single-ended reference clock out. These are running at lower frequency, so they're just using SMA, presumably to reduce costs. On the back side of the instrument, we have an AC power inlet, a cooling fan, a USB connector that doesn't seem to be used for anything, and then the Ethernet connection that provides the primary interface between the instrument and the outside world. This is only 100 megabit, but it doesn't move all that much data, so that's perfectly fine. The overall chassis design is actually quite nice to work in. These two screws here and two screws on the other side come off, then the front bezel slides off, and then there's a few more screws on either side, and the entire body of the instrument can slide out of the chassis. Just a few screws there under the feet and around the carrying handle. And here is the inside of the unit, a very clean, spacious design, plenty of room to work in. Uh, it looks like this was actually designed to be used for ATE applications and then possibly repackaged in a benchtop form factor, which makes sense given that the vendor does sell an ATE version with a very similar part number. They're probably the same board. So here is the Ethernet connection, and there's actually just a little RJ45 cable coming off from here to the back panel. Then same thing for the USB. Then mains power inlet coming down here to a connector on the main board. But if we zoom in a little bit, we can actually see there's a barrel jack that's not being used in this version of the instrument. But again, they're probably using the same board for the ATE version and the benchtop version. And then all of the front panel connectors are using short lengths of coaxial cable to connect from the front panel jacks to SMP connectors on the board vertically mounted for all of the high speed lengths. Down in the bottom left corner, we have the main processor assembly. It's a microchip PIC32 700 series. Uh, these are an older MIPS 4K 80 megahertz. Not super powerful, but again, it doesn't need to be. All it's doing is manipulating registers on the chip that does all the work. And this also runs the Ethernet interface. And here towards the center of the instrument, we have the meat of the entire device. This is a InFi 100 gigabit Ethernet Phi that is being used to both generate and receive all of the high-speed signals. Looking up here, we can see some of the differential pairs coming out on the top layer. We've got a few routed on the back layer. Notice the uh, fencing vias along here and then moving out. So this is transmit channel three. Again, some AC coupling capacitors in uh, either side of the differential pair going out towards uh, the coaxial connectors. And then down here on the right is the reference clock output muxing. These are actually a fully differential MUX, so there is a differential version of the output reference clock in here. It's just not pinned out to the front panel. The positive channel is connected, but then there's a floated connector here. So if for whatever reason you wanted to, it would probably not be too difficult to get this instrument to put out a differential reference clock. And the output is AC coupled, and then we can see we've got a 2 to 1 MUX here, a nice little test point on the MUX selector then another two to one mux, and then uh, another test point of the selector. So it looks like we have three options for reference clock out, which tracks when we get down to some of the block diagrams in a minute. And then just some power regulation here, some power regulation here, nothing else too exciting. Again, all of the meat is actually in the InFi chip. Very nice board to look at. Uh, everything's clearly labeled, LEDs, mux selectors, looks like some kind of debug header here. Zooming in up here, we can see some interesting things about the board design. In particular, they are using some sort of a low-loss substrate. It's not just standard FR4. The color is way too light for that, so it's probably Rogers or something along those lines. 
And right here, where we have a little jog out in the trace to match skew for the differential pair, you'll notice it actually gets a little bit wider than in the closely coupled areas. That's because this section of the trace is not coupled as strongly to its partner as uh, in the remainder of the pair. And so because of the lower coupling, the impedance goes up and the trace width is increased to compensate for that. So somebody spent a fair bit of time in EM Solver software optimizing that little transition there. And then behind the front panel right here, we just have some more power regulation, uh, linear technologies, uh, one amp voltage regulator, some switching power converters up here. Again, nice clearly labeled test points on all of the rails, super nice. And then in the top right corner of the board, we have the time base. Unfortunately, there's a lot of cables in the way, so it's hard to see all of the details, but I plan to actually use this instrument. It had a relatively fresh calibration, so I didn't want to mess with any of the cables and potentially disturb the calibration. But up here, we can see there's a Skyworks SI5000 series uh, PLL clock synthesizer. So this crystal here is the main time base for the entire board. We've got a test point on one of the outputs. And then down here, we've got a MUX for reference clock selection. So this is taking the external reference clock coming in from outside on the front panel and the output of the main synthesizer. And then we can see test points here for selecting the clock input. So between the internal synthesizer and the external front panel reference clock. And that's about all there is to the design. There's not a whole lot here other than the main Phi chip and the microcontroller. Everything else is just power regulation and a few muxes for clock selection. All of the fun happens in software. The vendor documentation is a little bit light on internal architectural details, so I wasn't able to find any kind of block diagram. So I drew up a few based on my own analysis of the instrument. So here's kind of an overview of the entire system. We have our time base, which we'll get into more detail on the next page. And that then drives the reference clock outputs as well as the transmit and receive clock. Then we have the four transmit channels and the four receive channels, and then a user pattern generator that allows you to output an arbitrary 16 or 40 bit pattern depending on the data rate. One thing that the documentation does not make particularly clear is that this pattern is actually shared. So if you have two channels in custom pattern mode, you have to send the same pattern out of each. Again, not a huge deal, but it would help if it was documented better. So looking at the time base, we have an internal oscillator feeding the Skyworks PLL and then an external reference clock from the front panel going into a multiplexer. The output of this multiplexer is the main time base for the entire system. So this can be selected directly as an option for the reference clock output. And then it is multiplied up by either 32x in low rate mode or 80x in high rate mode to get the final bit clock for all of the transmit interfaces. Now let's take a look at the transit path. We can send any of several standard PRBS patterns or a custom pattern of our choice through a multiplexer, select one of these patterns. The data is then fed through a serializer at the transmit clock rate, giving us a serial data stream at the desired bit rate. The raw serial data is then fed into a three tap feed forward equalizer, which gives us a precursor tap, a main cursor tap, and a post cursor tap, allowing us to cancel some of the ISI in the channel. And then finally, a configurable driver where we can invert the polarity of the signal and adjust the amplitude. On the receive side, we have a input buffer with selectable inversion, then feeding into a continuous time linear equalizer and a clock recovery PLL. The output of the clock recovery then goes through some dividers and a multiplexer to give us a reference out. We can get either 1 8th or 1 16th bit rate reference clock. The output of the CDR then goes into a variable sampling block, which allows us to sample the incoming data at arbitrary phases relative to the recovered clock and at arbitrary thresholds. This allows us to calculate a eye pattern, bathtub curve, determine bit error rate at any point within the unit interval, etc. And then the sample data stream is then fed into a pattern checker to check against any of the PRBS patterns that the instrument supports. This MUX is independent of the transmit side MUX, so you can be transmitting a PRBS 9 and receiving a PRBS 15, for example, if your transmit and receive are not connected to each other. Uh, note that there is no option for the user pattern on this MUX, so if you are transmitting a user pattern, there's no way to verify that pattern was sent correctly. Not a huge deal. Usually if you're doing late quality testing, you're going to be using a PRBS anyway.
And then the output of the pattern checker goes into error counters, which allow us to either read a raw bit error rate at the chosen sampling location, or integrate into an eye pattern or a bathtub curve, or whatever other measurement we're trying to accomplish. The reference clock out is just a simple multiplexer. At first glance, we have the recovered clocks divided down from received channels 1, 2, 3, 4. We have this low transmit clock. And then there's this other path. Uh, that took me a little while to understand. Again, the documentation was a little unclear on this, and the software doesn't really help show you what's really going on architecturally. But there's actually one more CERDES that is driven by the output of the user pattern generator and allows you to send an arbitrary 16-bit pattern out the reference clock port. And we'll see this when we get to the experimental portion of the video. Before we get any further, I just wanted to talk about how the variable sampler works and how we can actually get things like eye patterns and bathtub curves off of it. So with a normal serial data receiver, you have a single sampling point at the center of the eye. You want it to be at the midpoint of the UI in time. You want it to be at the midpoint of the opening vertically. And this is the point where you have the lowest bit error rate and where you are going to have the highest chance of recovering the data correctly. But if you're trying to actually measure the quality of the signal, that's not where you want to be sampling. So with a variable sampler, you can adjust the phase of the sampling clock relative to the recovery clock in the PLL in order to shift your sampling point left and right. And so let's say we want to sample right here just on the edge of the eye. Now we can start seeing occasional bit errors and uh, determine, okay, we're near the edge of the eye opening. And the same thing applies vertically. Rather than just using a fixed or adaptive threshold targeting the center of the eye, if we deliberately offset our sampling point in the vertical axis, we can, again, determine when we start seeing bit errors uh, as we move further and further from the vertical center of the eye and use this to determine how much margin we have in the vertical direction. And so if we scan our sampling point across the entire eye horizontally and vertically and accumulate bit error rate at each point, we can then plot a density map of bit error rate at every possible point within the UI, and that gives us our eye pattern. Now, if you're used to looking at eyes from a real-time scope, you'll notice this looks a little bit different, and that's because, again, it is only measuring bit error rates, so we can see the opening on the inside of the eye. We cannot see any detail on the outside. So uh, you're not going to be able to see things like overshoot or any ripple on the outer edge of the eye as long as the inner opening isn't affected. So again, it's a, it's a limitation of any sort of a BERT or CIRDES based eye scan. The trade-off, of course, is that you're looking at an instrument that costs probably an order of magnitude less than a real-time scope that can make a similar measurement. For our first experiment, we're going to be using the BERT as both source and sync. The output ports here are connected through these two cables into the input of this 300 millimeter long channel on low grade FR4 insertion loss of the entire channel end to end is a little over a dB per gigahertz, around five and a half dB at five gigahertz, maybe 11 dB at 10 gigahertz and so on. And then the output of the channel is then going into receive channel four on the BERT. So here's the BERT software. We're connected to the instrument and we are set up to run at 10.3125 gigabits per second, which is the 10 and 40 gig ethernet line rate. And we are currently sending a PRBS7 pattern, looking for a PRBS7 at 200 millivolt amplitude, no emphasis, and the default 3.3 dB of equalization on the receiver. And we can see that the receiver is locked, which is good. That's what we expect because the cables are connected and we should have a pretty strong signal. So the first thing we can do is grab a bathtub curve just to get a rough idea of what we're looking at. And so we can see that we've got a pretty good opening here. So this link is definitely usable, but there's still a fair bit of ISI, so we can probably improve that. But before we go play with any of the drive settings, let's look at an eye pattern and see if that tells us anything different. So we can click eye contour here and say start, grab a measurement. It says it'll take seven seconds. And here's our measurement. Again, we're just looking at the opening of the eye and we can't see any of the details on the exterior because we are just sampling raw bear. And so let's see if we can open this eye up a little bit if we play with some of the drive settings. I found about 10 to 15% on the post cursor tap was pretty good for this channel. So let's go grab another eye with that. And that's a pretty significant improvement. Let's see how much nicer the bathtub looks with these changes.
And again, significantly wider. So just a small change to the driver made a huge difference in this lossy channel. And a little bit later, we can take a look with the real-time scope and see what these emphasis settings are actually doing to the output waveform. And then if we wanted to, we could insert some errors into the transmit waveform if we were trying to test a receiver on some other device and see how it handled errors. Uh, we can play with the equalization settings in the receiver. We can adjust drive strengths in different test patterns and so on, all pretty standard. Additionally, we can grab a live streaming measurement of bear at the center of the eye here. If we just hit start, we can see we've got no errors and it's going to continue on integrating here. The instrument is capable of taking bare measurements at any vertical and horizontal offset within the eye because that's how it collects eye patterns. I wasn't able to find any way to get it to show live streaming bare measurements at any other location. The API allows this. They do have a uh, C API that you can call directly to script the instrument for ATE and so on. Using the GUI, I wasn't able to find any way to sample anywhere other than the center of the eye for this type of measurement. Again, minor annoyance, it's not usually something you care about. Usually you care about the reliability of the link, and the eye pattern tells you all you need to know about how much margin there is. But it would be nice to have that a little bit more exposed in the GUI. If we go to eye here, I think this offset might have something to do with that, or maybe that just moves the eye around, but I wasn't able to get it to give me just a bare measurement at that specific point. So we know that we can make this link work pretty reliably at 10 gigabits per second. Let's see what happens if we try to crank it up a little bit. Uh, I don't know how far we're going to get. Uh, the channel is pretty lossy, but I think we'll probably be able to get at least a 14 gig. So let's try that. We'll go to 14.0625 and hit apply, and we can see everything loses lock, and it thinks for a little bit as it resets the board and reconfigures thing. And now our receiver is locked again, so we can start an eye measurement and see what we get. That is a lot less pretty. See if maybe adding a little bit of post cursor will help. That definitely made a big improvement. Let's crank that up a little bit more. And maybe a little more on the post cursor as well. That actually made it worse. Let's go back to, we had it around 15. So you can see this is really useful for playing with equalization parameters, just kind of getting an idea of how to get the most out of a given link. And we can obviously use the BERT as either the source or sync. It doesn't have to be controlling both ends. We can be doing these measurements with an FPGA or ASIC or SFP or whatever at the other end of the link and try and see how we can get the most performance out of it. And so now that we've pushed this to 14 gig, we've got a usefully open eye. We can go grab a few quick bare measurements here and see if we're still pretty reliable at 14 gig. And yeah, we're 15 seconds in, still no bit errors. So I'd say we're still usable at 14 gig. Let's, let's push it to 25 gig just for kicks. I don't think it'll work. And we're reconfigured and still not seeing a receiver lock. I'm going to crank the equalization up a little bit more. Uh, one other little confusing tidbit I just noticed is that the equalizer is labeled a CTLE up here and a DFE here. I'm pretty sure it's actually a CTLE because uh, a DFE usually has a bunch of taps you can configure individually. And a CTLE is usually a, just a single adjustable boost level. So this, this may be left over the software from some of the other instruments that do have a DFE capability, but that's a little weird. One other thing I'll point out while I'm thinking about it is that the channels are using zero-based indexing in the software, 0, 1, 2, 3, but the front panel calls them 1, 2, 3, 4. So again, minor, minor rough edges. Anyway, we still haven't managed to get a lock at 25 gig here. We can crank the equalizer up just a little bit more, but I'm, I'm guessing that this channel is just too lossy to pass 25 gig. And so the BERT is doing exactly what we're asking. It's telling us what the limits of our channel are, and I think we found them. For our second experiment, we're going to be interfacing the BERT with some of the other equipment in the lab and take a look at the generated waveforms directly. We have the reference plot output connected to the 4 GHz Wave Runner 8000 series over here. Then the transmit differential pair from channel 1 is connected over to the 16 GHz SDA 8ZIA 
This is a 16 gigahertz, 40 gigahertz per second scope, so it's best suited to looking at signals up to around 10 gigabits per second. As we start pushing out towards 20, 25 gigabits per second, we're not going to be getting useful eye patterns and signal integrity results anymore because we're losing all the upper harmonics, but we can still do protocol decoding and so on. And finally, the external reference clock to the BERT is being generated by the Siglin SSG5060XV vector signal generator. This is a 6 gigahertz vector signal generator. We're going to be running a lot lower in the 300 megahertz range to generate reference clocks and then add various sorts of modulations to them so we can see what happens if we inject a spread spectrum clock into the BERT. Is it going to be able to track that? Are we going to be able to get good waveforms out and so on? Since this is a more complex multi-instrument test setup, I'm going to pull out a tool I haven't shown in this channel before. NG Scope Client, the next generation scope client, is a cross-platform vendor agnostic utility allowing you to uh, remote control and perform signal processing on instruments from a wide variety of manufacturers. So we are now connected to the 16 gigahertz SDA looking at the differential pair on the output. We are looking at the reference clock coming out of the BERT with the Wave Runner, and we are also connected to the BERT itself. And if you've used software such as GNU Radio before, you'll probably find the filter graph view very familiar. So now we're connected to the scopes in the BERT. Let's just add the signal generator real quick. So we can just say add RF generator, and we already know about the SSG because we've used it in the past. So I'm going to go add that here. And we can move these channels out of the way so they're not blocking our view of the main processing pipeline. So we can see now I've got channels 2 and 3 of the SDA are connected to the output of the BERT. We've got the controls for the BERT right here. And then the reference clock output of the BERT is then being displayed by the wave router. So before we go any further, I'll show you what we have configured on the BERT so far. The SDK allows pretty much complete remote control of the instrument. Once you have the BERT set up with NG Scope Client, you don't really need to use the GUI anymore. So we've currently got reference clock at the transmit LO over 32. We can see we're expecting a 322.265 megahertz output. We're using the internal clock source, so we're ignoring the external reference input so far. And we're set up to run at 10.325 gigabits per second. So let's take a look at the output reference and see if we're actually getting the frequency we expect. So we can say measure frequency. And that looks correct. Let's pop our measurements window over here and dock that on the right real quick. So if we want to look at how the frequency changes over time, all we got to do is add a moving average filter and uh, see if we can get rid of some of the noise that is probably going to be on the raw frequency measurement. Let's do 100 samples and then add that. Now we have our reference clock out trend. Let's take a look at what the actual transmit pairs are doing. So right now we're displaying our PWS7 pattern and uh, we're just looking at the raw differential legs. We can subtract those to get the actual differential value. So subtract. And that's our differential. Now we can get rid of the individual legs because we don't need those anymore. Now we can do an eye pattern on this if we want. Just say clock recovery PLL and 10.3125 gig. And there's our recovered clock. And then pull up an eye on that. Let's dock that off on the right here so it's not blocking our view of the waveform. And there's our eye pattern. We're running at 10 gig. This is simulating, say, a 10 gig Ethernet length so we can pull up the I mask for XFI. And we are now passing that with a uh, 1 to the minus 5 hit rate. So kind of marginal. Again, there's a little bit of eye closure here. We can improve that very easily if we go to the equalizer settings on the transmit port. And we can see right now we have the swing at 200 millivolts and the FFE for both precursor and postcursor are at zero. So if we remember from our previous testing, we got much better results. We turned the post cursor tap up just a little bit. So let's go up to about 12. And if we clear our sweeps, now we have a much prettier looking eye. And we're now not hitting the mask at all. And looking at the time domain waveform, it's a lot prettier as well.
We can obviously adjust our data rate, but what I'm more interested in doing is seeing what happens if we add a modulation to the clock. So we'll zoom out a little bit so we can get a better trend of the overall measurements here. And right now we're looking at internal reference clock at 10.3125, and we're expecting a 322.26 uh, clock frequency. So let's switch to the external reference. And it's going to think for a second. We can go clear. And the amplitude is going to reset as well. The entire BERT resets pretty much when you adjust uh, the frequency. So that is one thing to be aware of. Is it is, the outputs are going to glitch a fair bit as you're changing the clock frequency. For some reason, it's not just resetting the synthesizer. It needs to reconfigure pretty much everything. So now we're going to zoom in a little bit here, and we're seeing again the ref out is 322.5, which is exactly what we're putting in. And let's add a little bit of modulation to this, see if we can get a spread spectrum clock, see if the transmit PLL is going to track that and so on. So we can just go to the signal generator and turn on analog modulation, and we can see right now we are set up for a... We can see we are set up for a sinusoid with 125 kilohertz deviation at 100 kilohertz. And there is our measured clock frequency. So we can see pretty much what we expect. We're going up to that's 100 kilohertz, that's 150. And so with the noise in there, yeah, it looks like we're centered at about 125 kilohertz deviation. And again, this is looking at the reference clock out from the BERT. So this is not the CDR recovered clock. If we wanted to trend that and see if the BERT is actually tracking the spread spectrum clock, that's easy enough to do. So we can just take a measurement of frequency here and then we can see 5.16 ish gigahertz. Again, that's what we expect. And then do a moving average on that. And we're going to say 50 samples as well. And then we can make a new waveform view for that. And sure enough, we are seeing the exact same modulation on the transmit data. So that's exactly what we expect. It means that the PLL in the BERT is successfully multiplying up our modulated transmit clock, and we are getting a spread spectrum modulated clock on the high-speed data link. So we've had a good look at the signals coming out of the high-speed test ports in the BERT. Now let's focus on the reference clock output. Right now we are set up in CDR mode with channel 3 selected and we're outputting rate over 16. So for 10.3125 gig it calculates we should be seeing 64 to 4.53 megahertz. And if we switch back to the scope view that is exactly what we see about 644 megahertz. So that's normal. And then we can switch to rate over 8 and now we should get double that. And let's just zoom in a little more here. And sure enough, we're seeing exactly that, about 1.28 gigahertz, which sounds correct. So where things get more interesting is if we select clock out mode here. So now we are outputting the divided transmit clock using the CIRDES mode on the ref clock mux. So for example, if we select four, we are actually outputting a pattern of uh, 0x CCCC. So 1100, 1100 out of the ref clock port. And if we go to the scope view, now we can see 2.5 gigahertz as we expect. This is a four gigahertz scope, so we're losing some of the harmonics. And then if we select, say, divide by eight, then we're going to be now at 1.2 gigahertz. And again, that's what we would expect. But the thing to keep in mind is that when we are using this divided clock mode, the uh, pattern generator is in custom mode because we are using the CIRDES, which means that it is sharing harder resources with any transmit channels that are in custom mode. So to demonstrate this, let's select transmit pattern on channel zero of custom and let's do FF00 and we're gonna select this. And so you would expect that this isn't gonna change the output and we're still gonna see 1.28 gigahertz. But if we go back to the scope view, we're actually seeing 644 megahertz now because we're producing that custom pattern. So just to demonstrate that 
this is not just some weird thing happening with the dividers. We can select a transit pattern that has a glitch in it. So say FF02, and we set this. Again, we are changing the configuration on the user pattern for transmit channel zero. We haven't messed with the clock out settings at all. And then if we go to the scope view, now we see this glitch here. And again, this glitch is probably actually going to full swing. We're using a four gigahertz scope here at uh, the raw data rate going to the zero. This is actually 10 gigabits per second. So we're losing a little bit of the upper harmonics. But the point is that we are changing the behavior of the reference clock output port when we are in this clock out mode by selecting the user pattern here. And this isn't necessarily that big a problem in practical use because usually you're going to have a PRBS pattern on the transmit channels and you'll be using the ref clock to sync to it. But it is a little bit counterintuitive and I wish the user interface made it a little bit more obvious what's going on. This is actually potentially useful if you want to be able to produce custom patterns on an extra port while you're doing a normal BERT test. But the user interface definitely could make it more obvious what's going on. And just to demonstrate that the custom pattern generator is in fact shared both ways, Let's try the other way around. So right now we are sending a PRBS7 out of channel zero, which is connected to the scope. Let's change that to a custom pattern and let's continue with that FF02 glitch pattern that we had before. And if we then switch back to ng-scope client looking at the waveform, we can see that we've got the expected big pulse with the glitch attached. And now we're not gonna touch the custom pattern settings at all on the transmit. We're just gonna change the clock divider in the software here. Let's go to say divide by 16. And now we are seeing that divide by 16 clock on the transmit port of the BERT as well as on the reference clock port. So anytime you're changing the custom pattern either via the divider in the clock output port or on any channel, you are changing the custom pattern for all ports. The good news is that despite some of the GUI quirks, the API is actually very powerful. And so once it's integrated with a tool like ng-scope client, you have the ability to completely remote control the instrument and not have to deal with any of the quirks of the official user interface. In Edgescope Client, rather than attempting to display the custom pattern as a per channel attribute, which can be a little confusing, I display it as a global setting in order to make it more clear that it is a shared resource. So right now we are set for clock out over 32. And if we switch to Serdes mode, the default is going to be AAA, so sending out one half the transmit clock rate. And if we then change this to say FF00, and this also, of course, allows us to send arbitrary patterns out on the reference clock if we want. So we could do, again, FF02 like we were doing in the demo before, and we can get our glitch there. And this is not affecting any of the transmit ports as long as they are not in custom pattern mode. And of course, if we wanted to, we could say take transmit channel 1 and output the custom pattern on it. And now we're seeing the same FF02 pattern here. But if we then switch back to, say, a PRBS7, then it's decoupled from the reference clock port again. And all of this is made possible by the fact that ng-scope client is open source, so it's very easy to add support for new instruments or even new types of instruments. If you're interested in trying it out, I will put a link to the GitHub in the video description. Before we get to our final experiment, I'm just gonna demonstrate the use of ng-scope client for iPattern and bathtub measurements as well. So we currently have our transmit set up at 200 millivolt swing, no precursor, no postcursor emphasis, sending a PRBS7. And our receiver is set with default equalization. We are locked and expecting a PRBS7 as well. So all we gotta do is click the I button up here and wait a few seconds and we can get our I pattern. And if we don't like the color scheme, we can change it to something else, say here. And so one of the things that I did in the eye pattern viewer in Angioscope Client when using BERTs as the source of the eye data is providing the ability to read out real-time bear measurements at any given point in the eye, which again, the API allows, but the vendor software doesn't provide an easy way to do. So right now we can see that we've got a bear of essentially zero. If we move the cursor up to around here. Now we can see we're down to about six to the minus three. We can go a little bit further off on the edge of the eye. Now we're down to the minus two. If we wanna see what happens if we say change equalization settings over time, we can also just plot a measurement of the real time bear and see a live view, or we can do a trend plot of that as well. And we'll just move that off on the side there and zoom out a little bit. 
And let's change our integration time a little bit to say 20 million points, just so we can get a little bit more resolution at lower bear values. And if we say move the measurement point up to around here, now we're going to start seeing the bear has gone way up because we're sampling near the edge of the eye. But we can improve this if we play with the transmit equalization settings. So let's say we want to turn the post cursor up just a little bit. Let's say up to about 10 and give it a quick delay. And we've now already got the bear back to, again, pretty much zero. And if we grab another eye pattern here... We can see the eye has opened up quite a bit. And again, that's to be expected. We've got a uh, lower bear, so now the cursor is no longer on the edge of the eye. But if we want to get a little bit more data down over here, we can pull the cursor off on the edge and again, see that the bear is starting to increase at that point. And for our final experiment, we've got channel three of the BERT hooked up through a 150 millimeter long channel on the channel emulation board to this little board that I built a while ago, which was actually my main source of high-speed test signals uh, before I got this BERT. It is a TI retimer that is configured to output PRBSs at your choice of a couple of data rates. For today, we're only going to be running at 10 gig because the BERT actually can't run any lower than 8.5. So 1.25, 2.5, and 5 are actually a little bit too slow for the BERT to lock to. And we'll leave it at the default swing. We can select either PRBS9 or PRBS31 test patterns. And then we have some analog de-emphasis on uh, the output that we can see how that changes the eye as seen by the BERT. This is actually pretty interesting because usually output emphasis is using a FFE or similar tap-based structure. Whereas in this case, it's actually a purely analog RC-based circuit that provides a little bit of boost on transitions without regard to the data rate. So it looks a little bit different when seen in a real-time scope, and I'm kind of curious what it's going to do in the BERT. So now we're back in EngieScope Client, and we're already connected to the BERT. Let's add the power supply that is controlling the board as well, just so we can see what's going on there. And we'll drag those out of the way since we're not going to be doing any processing on the power data. But we can see right now that we're pulling about 194 milliamps at 5 volts on the PRBS generator board. And as of now, our receiver is not locked. That is to be expected because the test board is putting out a PRBS 9 and we are telling the BERT to look for a PRBS 7. So let's bump that up to a PRBS 9 and we should see a lock pretty quickly. And sure enough, we're now locked. So let's pull an eye pattern off and see what it looks like. And again, this is going through a 150 millimeter long low grade FR4 channel with no emphasis on the transmit currently. So it's probably not gonna be that great. It's actually more open than I expected. That actually looks pretty good without any additional emphasis. I'm impressed. But we do have some equalization on the receiver, so let's see what happens if we turn that down. And grab another eye. And now we're seeing a lot more eye closure with the equalization turned off on the receiver. Let's see if we can make up for some of that with emphasis in the transmit side. And let's grab another eye and see what that did. And that's a pretty good improvement in the eye. And obviously we can go a little bit higher on the transmitter if we want to, but I don't think there's a need to, given that we are seeing a bear of essentially zero. If we go back off on the edge here, still zero over here. Just starting to hit down at the minus sevens right on the edge. So still very open. And of course, if we wanted to, we could grab a bathtub curve as well. And we can see what that's going to look like. Yep, still pretty good. Overall, I'm a big fan of the hardware, and I think it'll be a nice addition to the lab. I'm looking forward to doing more experiments with it. There are definitely some rough edges on the software front, but it's possible to work around most of those with the API. And that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this little review and demonstration, as well as the introduction of NGScope Client. And please let me know what you think in the comments.